Thank you so much, Joanne, and, and uh, thank all of you for being here and for what you do. And I said to Raj as he was leaving, it's not every day you get hoots and cheers like this in the field we are. So thank you for being so enthusiastic. And there's a lot to be enthusiastic of, and Raj is absolutely right, the ability to come together for partnership. And I just want to start and say that he didn't mention the Lancet Commission on Global Health which uh, Larry Summers chaired. And what it basically said is that we have a once in history opportunity to bring together uh, these divergences that exist. And what he's meant by that is that, you know, a thousand years ago, everybody was poor and everybody had ill health. And then the Industrial Revolution occurred and some people were able to buy themselves into good health through good public health, through good housing, through good food, water, sanitation, all of those interventions, and others remain behind. But today, with our technologies, we have the ability for a grand convergence where even if we can't make everybody rich, we can bring that health up. And so I think you're seeing across the spectrum an understanding that this is a special time and we've got something we can do about it. Now, um, I'm going to talk to you about immunization. That's my job. It's not that I think I think immunization ought to exist by itself, but immunization certainly is an important component of this. So let's start, and we're going to be doing a, a little bit of a slide presentation here, and I'm going to have to look at it while we do it. Every second somewhere in the world, more than 30 children are immunized. And you can see that this is a very, very powerful thing reaching across the earth. It's led to smallpox eradication, it's led to polio being in the end game, a 95% reduction of measles, and it's led to healthier lives and stronger communities. This is the power of vaccines. And what's important is no other intervention on earth touches so many lives. It's a really important point. All the other interventions we have, this is the one that reaches the furthest. And what has it done? Take a look at these dramatic arrows focusing down here. You can see reductions in disease, diphtheria, measles, pertussis, polio, tetanus, extraordinary reductions. And this is occurring at a time when population has actually gone up almost 60%. So this is the type of power that vaccines have to affect public health. Now, you've heard already about the dramatic reductions that have occurred in uh, child deaths. And this is the official numbers. Um, you can see almost a 50% reduction. And of course, you know that the bad news is that we're not on target to, to meet the MDGs here to 4.2 million deaths by 2015. You see the slope of the line would have to be um, uh, more steep. And of course, Vaccines aren't the only reason that's this, that, that these numbers have come down, but it's an important part of it. And in fact, had we had the powerful vaccines we have now, in fact, this line would have been steeper and we would have been on track. But one thing that's important as you advocate and discuss about this is actually, I showed you in the previous slide what hap what's happened to population. So had the population had the same mortality rate in 1990, actually there would have been 17 million deaths. So you can see the reduction down to 6.6 .6 million deaths is even more dramatic. Again, we're not on target to where we need to be, but this has been an incredible revolution that is really making a difference. So what is Gavi? Gavi is about working with all these partners. We don't have people on the ground. The idea is not to waste our effort in trying to build systems that are in parallel to others. It's to work with others and use their systems. And you can see Jim's coming later. Um, obviously, this talks about you know, the donors, the companies, all of the folks that are engaged in making this happen. Um, and this is why we actually have an overhead rate of 3%, because we're able to work with other systems rather than build ourselves. And what we focused on trying to do is to bring a range of new and powerful vaccines. And, and this is critical because we now have vaccines that target the largest killers of children. And so we're able to take these tools and bring them into communities and have a dramatic effect. And these are vaccines that wouldn't otherwise make it into these communities. And we do this in the lowest income countries, the 73 poorest countries in the world. The idea is not that these are the only countries that need these vaccines. Every country needs these vaccines, but these are the countries that need our help, who couldn't do it by themselves. And in doing this, we're immunizing 
more children, and we're strengthening health systems in some of the most difficult places on Earth. And you can see here some of the countries that uh, we're working in. So this makes it a huge challenge to be able to reach children in these countries. And we have a lot to show for this. Sorry, this is running a little slow. So together, we've been able to, sorry. We've been able to immunize, uh, it says here, 440 million. That was at the end of last year. We're getting close to half a billion additional children have been immunized in this program. And this has prevented more than 6 million future deaths. So this is, I mean, these are quantifiable numbers. And uh, if anything, these are conservative estimates. So we've been able to make a dramatic difference with this program. And if you look at the world, this is looking at uh, DPT3, which is the tracer vaccine we've been using for about 73 years. And the good news, as you see, is that that number has been going up and up in terms of coverage. Still, 17% of people aren't uh, receiving these basic vaccines, and we have to work to get those people having those vaccines. But this hides some of the inequities that exist. Here is looking at the wealthiest countries, and here is looking at the poorest countries. And you can see in the poorest countries, 26% are still being missed with at least the basic vaccines. And that's more than 20 million children. So this is important for what we need to continue to do in the future. But with these new vaccines, we'd be able to drive an equity that hasn't existed before. Um, here on the left, we're looking at hepatitis B. Um, this is a vaccine that is against um, liver cancer as well as hepatitis as a disease. And you can see that in, on, on the left here, in high-income countries, you can see much higher um, uh, uh, coverage rates than in low-income countries. Here we are looking now 13 years later, and you can see that actually more low-income countries are rolling this vaccine out than high-income countries. This is what we're talking about in terms of bringing equity to the world. And of course, these diseases are more common in the developing world. Here's another example. This is the pneumococcal vaccine, which is against uh, pneumonia, the most common cause of pneumonia, uh, arguably the largest killer of children. And you can see this is earlier in its rollout, but you can see the difference here in high-income countries, it's gotten pretty high coverage in low-income countries. In just four years, a really big increase in coverage. So what happens if you get these vaccines out? Well, this is looking at um, Haemophilus influenza type B, a common cause of meningitis and pneumonia, ear infections. And you can see what happens. This is active surveillance, where you go out and make sure you're catching every case. And you can see that with immunization, diseases disappear. I could put many other diseases up here and show you exactly the same thing. So we don't have disease surveillance everywhere, as Dr. Shaw talked about. We need better data. But where we have it, we're seeing this dramatic effect. Let me give you another example. This is the meningitis belt across Africa. Every few years, there would be an unbelievable epidemic of meningitis that would completely stop activities, economic growth. Children would get meningitis. Many would die. Many would be left with the permanent sequelae of having had meningitis. We were able to immunize with a new vaccine specifically designed for this 153 million people over about two and a half years. Look at what happened to the disease. There's the countries. Look at what happened to the disease. So we're still able to see other forms of meningitis. But this disease, which has existed since the beginning of time, or at least history in these countries, is now completely disappearing. This is the power of vaccines. Yet, even though we've done so much and we've come so far, here is looking at some of the new vaccines. And you can see that some of the vaccines, uh, the rotavirus and pneumococcal, this is against pneumonia and diarrhea, the two largest killers of children, are still relatively low. It's not that we're not doing our job. It's that these have just begun to be introduced over the last few years. So this is the critical priority for us in this next period. What are we trying to do? We're trying to take a child and have that child be fully protected 
against the 11 diseases that WHO recommends. We call that the fully immunized child. And that child then is able to live up to its full potential, to learn, to not be malnourished, to be able to go on to live up to their full IQ. So where are we on that goal? Well, today we're less than 5% of the world's children are fully immunized. And where can we get to if we're fully funded? This is what we expect to have happen. By 2020, we plan to get to 50% of the children in the poorest countries being fully immunized. So this is a very um, uh, big goal and um, a challenging one, given the countries I've already shown you. And it's important to say that vaccines aren't just about protecting against disease, which you can see on the upper right is obviously critical, but it leads to better education and cognitive development. It reduces health care costs, and that's important in these countries because people pay for health care out of pocket. So it keeps families from tipping into poverty. With healthy families and healthy mothers, you have smaller families, and that obviously leads to more productive families and a healthy, more productive workforce and a healthy population lead to stronger economies. So this type of virtuous loop is what we're trying to get and is critical to the goal of ending poverty. So where are we? Well, as, as Joanne has already said, we're entering our second replenishment. This is an opportunity to reinvest in Gavi. And this period is going to be the largest investment in Gavi ever, because as countries get richer, they graduate from Gavi. And we, during this, next 20, during this next period, 22 countries will be graduating from Gavi. So in this next period, we're going to have to help countries subsidize their purchase of 2.7 billion doses of vaccine. But in the period afterwards, those numbers go way down. So this is a, a leap, a, a sprint. This is not about budgets continuing to go up every year. This is about doing this once during this period. And if we can raise the funding, which we're asking for 7.5 billion US dollars against a total investment of 9.5 billion, which we already have 2 billion um, in long-term investments for, for 7.5 billion, we can have some dramatic effects. So what can we get for that? we can immunize an additional 300 million children. This is up from the 243 million that we were able to do in this period. So for about a 15% increase in finance, and I'll come back to that, we're able to go up uh, more than 20% in number of children immunized. And just to put this in perspective, because it's a big number, this means that more than half of the children immunized on Earth will be receiving a Gavi vaccine. With this, we'll be able to prevent five to six million future deaths. And that's equivalent to preventing the death of every single person in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, as uh, shown here. Not just in Washington, D.C., but in Arlington and, and surrounding states, et cetera. So this just gives you an idea of the magnitude we're talking about. So for an additional $7.5 billion over five years, we're able to immunize 300 million additional children, resulting in five to six million lives saved, an increase from five to 50% of children fully immunized with the 11 vaccines that WHO recommends for every child on Earth. And the economic benefits of this are between 80 and $100 billion of direct measurable economic benefits. So this is a very, very good investment. So, you know, what are we asking here in the U.S. And, and, and in other places? You can see here our total contribution from 2000 to 2015. You can see the U.K. here is the largest supporter, um, the Gates Foundation the next largest, Norway the next, and the U.S. is fourth. The U.S. now represents about 8.5% of our overall support. Um, we were delighted to see that uh, the administration asked for $200 million for fiscal year 15, and we think that that's great, and we hope that you're going to help us argue for that. Um, we, we recently had uh, luck at the uh, G7 summit where Angela Merkel here, who is going to host 
our replenishment conference in February. You can see the language that got put into uh, the G7, um, uh, uh, supporting Germany and its offer to host the replenishment, and reaffirming our commitment and call on other public and private donors to contribute to the replenishment of the Gavi Alliance. So we really need your help. What we're asking for in this next period is uh, both that uh, the government support the 200 million, the Congress supports the 200 million asked, the administration did, and we understand that that's going well right now in discussion in the, in the Senate and the House uh, later this week. Um, we're also asking during this next period for the 16 to 20 that the U.S. government try to offer a $1 billion over four years uh, pledge. Um, we know that the administration doesn't like to do multiple year pledges, but we think it's important to signal to the other donors who are also going to have to stretch and lift if we're able to get to this level of financing so we can deliver these types of results we're talking about. We're also asking that a congressional resolution uh, be put forth and we're looking for different groups to sign this. This is a uh, resolution that is basically talking about the importance of these child survival issues and um, the importance of, of doing this and, and, and making sure that countries are supporting the work that's going on. And I think this is a, a very good way to engage with Congress people, particularly ones who might not know a lot about this. It's an opportunity to get in and talk about it. And one thing I think that's important about this is that um, as we talk to congressmen, even very conservative ones, they love a few things about the Gavi model. They love the fact that it's about child survival and saving children's lives. They love the fact that we're working with industry and that we're able to drive down vaccine prices as part of this. And we've seen a dramatic reduction in, 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 in vaccine prices, 37% for the basic vaccines in the first few years of this last replenishment period. And industry is fully engaged with us. We're going to continue to see their engagement and more and more manufacturers are joining us to create a healthy uh, uh, marketplace for vaccines, healthy competition. So that's really good. And then the third thing is that countries are carrying their own share. So in this last period, we've had about $400 million that the countries have actually financed. In the next period, as countries um, get closer to graduation, that number goes up to $1.2 billion that countries are financing. So what this is, is aid that has an end, that countries are co-financing, that industry is co-financing, and obviously that donors are co-financing. So what is the call? We'd like to call for a fully funded Gavi Alliance. We'd like to have acknowledged that Gavi is delivering on its promise. We had a midterm review last year that went over all the numbers and showed we were on track to, uh, to meet our goals. And together we demonstrate uh, results, and results, 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 as, as we're here to talk about, the value for money and the return on investment a sustainable business model for development, as we just talked about, one where countries get help when they need it, and as they get wealthy then, they graduate from it, and the innovation that exists in a public-private partnership. And, and critical to this is that long-term predictable funding is critical to having uh, this effort to save lives and protecting people's health. Because what's happened in this last five years is we've scaled up in an unprecedented way. But to do that, industry had to invest tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in building the plants, the facilities, the fill and finishing to scale up so dramatically into billions and billions of doses of vaccines. And that type of predictability is necessary, but it's ultimately what drives down the price. So it's a critical part of the model. So with that, um, uh, just to remind us that, that vaccines are one of the best investments in future generations, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.